since this is a grand round, we should start with a clinical case. This is a recent case that we saw, a, a typical patient in all our practices, we get this. So it's a 73-year-old man who is overweight, he has obstructive sleep apnea, comes with shortness of breath, was given diuretics outside and he went into acute uh, kidney injury. Uh, he also had some dizziness, was found to be in 2 is to 1 block, poorly controlled diabetes, hypertension, carpal tunnel syndrome, history of alcohol in the past, but he swears he stopped it. And then he comes with uh, frequent PVCs on the EKG. Standard patient we see all the time, and the things in the red could all be responsible for the heart failure. So the, the question is, what among these is causing the heart failure, and are there specific therapies for that? So essentially, with all these expensive investigations, we don't have a diagnosis. We sent it for genetic sequencing, nothing in the gene also. So we have a true idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy now, despite very expensive investigation. So the question is, what investigations are appropriate, and how do we decide what to do? So we all have templates in our minds when we see heart failure patients. The usual question is, is it preserved or reduced EF? Is it, then you ask for ischemic or dilated. Now dilated is this big waste paper basket. You have to go and find out what's happening. And so then one, after that, you ask for other questions. And I would submit to you that the only way to figure out all this is advanced imaging. And in advanced imaging, it's mainly becoming a CMR game with some role for nuclear techniques uh, for inflammation. A CMR becomes a one-stop shop. It's not that echo doesn't have a role or uh, nuclear doesn't have a role, but you can get a lot of things. So the, here is uh, the stress part of it and the rest part of it. So you can figure out whether it is uh, ischemic or non-ischemic based on whether somebody has a ischemic defect or not. Here you can see a big defect here in the subendocardial region in one coronary artery and that is the rest myocardial perfusion. How good is a CMR compared to nuclear uh, techniques is, or echo techniques is still a matter of debate. Uh, some of the randomized trials, the CE mark studies and all seem to suggest that CMR is better than nuclear, but it had its own problems. In, so the accuracy of the nuclear in that arm wasn't as good as what is known in uh, other centers. And then of course, LGE also scar attributes tell you more than uh, what's a scar. It, it the LGE, both the location and the extent, correlates with both mortality and sudden cardiac death. And more importantly, if you see on the bottom here, uh, it seems to predict prognosis even in people with mildly reduced EF, which is a area where we have difficulty in uh, prognostication. We don't have a lot of data, but here is a randomized trial from Canada that looked at going echo CMR uh, versus just a standard way of uh, looking at it. Everybody gets CMR or you get CMR only if there's a question that other things can't answer. And they found that whether uh, the type of uh, diagnosis you come up with and the total amount of people who are diagnosed ends up to be about the same. And at the end of a year, there is no big difference in outcome. So one year may be short, but it seems to say that CMR allows you to diagnose early, but eventually you probably get to the diagnosis with your traditional methods. Okay, so now we'll go to some esoteric stuff. So future in imaging, right? So essentially these are the targets that has had uh, significant studies, right? Remodeling, architecture, stiffness, studying the microvasculature, studying inflammation, fibrosis, uh, infiltration, right? There's, there was a lot of enthusiasm in innervation imaging a few years ago because that correlated with arrhythmic death, but it's kind of plateaued off. Multi-organ imaging is coming up. That is something that you will keep hearing and uh, might, might be of interest. There is cellular level imaging. We won't cover that at this stage, but there are very, very significant advances in identifying what's happening at the cellular level, cellular metabolism. There are new ways of in, in, uh, incorporating AI, ML, and RC, in RCTs as well as imaging. So if you look at this, you can see RBC flows, right? I don't know if it's projecting, but you can see. 
So, this is open heart uh, uh, preparation, but uh, you can get that degree of uh, flow pictures and distribution to various areas. So, this is uh, something that is coming as a futuristic thing. What else is happening? So, there are obviously inflammation imaging, there are multiple receptors that you can track, whether it is an active macrophage or adhesion molecules. There is some distance. You can also do that simultaneously in the brain and the heart. Here is thrombospodin. They are looking at brain and the heart. And as the myocardium evolves, uh, myocardial infarction evolves, the degree of uptake in the brain is changing. And this is one way of looking at neuroglial changes associated with uh, what is happening in the heart seems to be reflecting the, into the neuro neuroglia. And so, you could track uh, effects of one organ with the other. So, this is where generative imaging is coming, right? And this, the, the first paper in generative imaging came in 2014, I think, Jonathan Goodfellow. And everything that you see now, all your chat GPTs, all your image things, everything comes from that paper. So, this is so new, right? And what essentially it does and where it affects us in medical imaging is this. So, essentially, you can get a CT image and you can create an MR image from the same data set. You can create an echo image from the same data set. So, you can actually, essentially when you capture an image, it is a ball of data, right? So, now they have mathematical ways of converting and here is an example of the same patient, right? So, they took cross modality. So, they took one modality and then they can create other modalities from the same study. 